white canes provide a visual reminder of the challenges facing the blind. And construction at the Capitol continues. We update you on the progress in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Barkey. Traditionally, a non-budget year of a two-year legislative cycle focuses on passing a capital investment bill. That tradition has been broken over the last decade, with smaller bonding bills passing in non-bonding years. Well, we caught up with Senator Leroy Stumpf, the chair of the Senate Capital Investment Committee, to talk a little bit about what we can expect in the year 2014. But first, John Bruin provides details on the bonding process. Borrowing money to pay for capital improvement projects is often referred to as bonding. A capital improvement is considered the construction or repair of new or existing publicly owned buildings, public property, or land. In addition to being publicly owned, a capital improvement must have a useful life of more than 10 years. Bonding is paying for capital improvements through the sale of general obligation bonds. The process starts when the legislature enacts and the governor signs a bonding bill. That bonding bill authorizes the state to sell bonds, in other words, to take on debt to pay for specified projects. Bonding is exactly like a mortgage. Um, instead of having one lender, like a bank in a mortgage, you have a lot of lenders who are the investors in your bonds. Um, and they're getting an interest rate in exchange for having fronted you the money. Determining which projects will be recommended as part of a bonding bill is the responsibility of legislative committees, where members may spend many hours reviewing numerous project requests. The capital investment committees for both the House and the Senate uh, get educated about all of the projects that have requested bonding money. And they do, to, do that in several ways. One is that they travel the state um, in the fall and maybe early winter, and they get a chance to see the projects firsthand and also um, they may have hearings at locations outside of the Capitol to hear from local officials who are asking for the projects or from agency officials who are asking for the projects. And then um, also uh, the Capital Investment Committees may have hearings here at the Capitol during session where they hear about more projects. And that's their way of getting educated about the projects to make choices about which ones they want to fund. Bonding requests pour in from all over the state. Lawmakers do their best to whittle them down into a manageable and acceptable bonding bill, as was the case in 2012. There were over 300 project requests for over $3 billion, and less than $500 million was approved in the bonding bill. So half to two-thirds of the projects are, are not funded each year. Once the projects have been determined and the bonding bill becomes law, a bidding process begins to determine who will sell the state's bonds. The Minnesota Management and Budget Office uh, organizes an auction where underwriters bid to be the one to sell our bonds. And then the one that bids the lowest interest rate is the one who gets the contract to issue the bonds and then they sell them to investors. So uh, investors don't buy the bonds directly from the state, they buy them from underwriters. Typically, the legislature debates a bonding bill during the second year of each two-year legislative biennium. However, legislators are not limited to the every other year tradition. Bonding bills were passed and signed by the governor in both 2011 and 2012. The 2014 legislative session is expected to be a bonding year, and the governor is advocating for a $1 billion bonding bill. Joining me right now is chair of the Senate Capital Investment Committee, Senator Leroy Stumpf, to look, talk a little bit about a tour you're about to take and about the upcoming session. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um... Senator, you're about to embark on a tour to check out some sites. First, before we get into the specifics of the bonding bill or what you can talk about at this point, how much do tours like this play into the projects that are eventually selected and placed in the bill? Well, I think they're very important because it's hard to really understand the project unless you actually see it. And uh, now it's impossible to see all the projects because there's an awful lot of them. But the ones that we try to pick out are the ones that are, we feel are very important for the state. And there are $2.8 billion in requests as of now. $2.1 billion of those are for the colleges and universities. So are a lot of the stops going to focus on those areas or are you checking out some smaller communities? 
Well, we have, I, I kind of divide it up in about three different uh, kind of categories. First of all, the state of Minnesota is responsible for a, a fair amount of infrastructure from our prisons to our state hospitals, uh, to the parks and, and uh, trails and things like that. And then there's a, a, the higher education, which has always been a very large part of the bonding uh, package in the past. And then the local, um, local projects, uh, which are community type uh, projects, uh, economic development type projects, things like that. You spoke a little bit about some of the ways that you select the projects that end up in the bill, but really a little more specifically, what criteria are you looking for? Is it job creation? Is it the most greatest need? Kind of outline your philosophy. Well, I think the, the most important thing is to try to preserve the assets of the uh, state of Minnesota. These are publicly owned assets, whether it's a, a bridge or whether it's a, uh, a park, uh, or a higher education institution. Uh, it's a very important part of what, what the uh, public has. And it's very important for economic development. Uh, education, for example, is a huge driver of, of our future, our future economy. So I think the, the important thing is, is, first of all, to preserve the assets that we have and improve them if we can. And then I think <clears throat> we look at projects that would uh, enhance the economic development of our state. Uh, it could be uh, a project that, it could be a housing project, it could be a, a dredging project, it could be a bridge, any, any number of, of things. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the process that we, I use anyway. Speaking of asset preservation, the legislature last session did pass a $156 million bonding bill. It included $109 million for the People's House, the state capitol building. It's anticipated that another $126 million will be requested in 2014 for the building. Is it going to be a hard sell or do you think this is something that most members are still supportive of? Well, I think most members are supportive of this and I, I think once you get into a project as large as the capital and, and its surrounding uh, uh, aspects and facilities, you really have to complete it. It would be, I think, a, a disaster and a black eye for all of us if we got into the reconstruction and renovation of the capital and then left it half uh, finished. So I think, I think we'll have to move forward and, and finish this project, which again, as you mentioned, is really the people's house. And that's, that's a very important uh, um, a very important building in the state of Minnesota. My final question for you is a $1 billion, bill, $1 billion bonding bill is, of course, what the governor is looking for. Some members of the GOP in particular don't believe large bonding bills are necessarily good policy. So if it comes down to it, do you anticipate a $1 billion bonding bill, first of all? And if not, what kind of projects might be the first to fall off of the radar? Do you think something like the Capitol could? Well, I think the, the important thing is that we operate under some guidelines. Uh, some people or some legislators feel uh, the guidelines are too restricted. Uh, but I, the guidelines kind of give us a certain um, parameter that we work in. Uh, and right now we are uh, getting uh, relatively tight in terms of how much the state of Minnesota can bond for. It's not so much that that the state of Minnesota can't afford it. I believe the state of Minnesota can afford some fairly large bonding bills. The problem is, is that we have other projects that have kind of used up some of that capacity, such as the Viking Stadium or the Stillwater Bridge or a number of other projects that have kind of come in the back door through, a, through not the bonding process through our capital investment committee, but have come in through the tax committee or other other means. So we have to look at, uh, and, and I'm looking forward uh, as Representative Houseman and I, and hopefully the governor can sit down and leadership and see if there isn't a, a way for us to re-examine the capacity that the state of Minnesota has. So we can do some really good things uh, at when we have relatively low interest rates, yeah. Okay, Senator Leroy Sump, good luck on the tour. Of course, we'll track your committee during session. We appreciate it. Thank you very much and have a nice day.
The 2014 bonding bill will likely include an additional $126 million for the capital restoration. John Bruin lays out the project details from phase one of this massive project. This particular phase we have exterior stone repairs. That's, that's dealing with life safety issues we have from pieces that were at risk of falling on the exterior stone. Uh, we're, we're stopping the water damage that's been occurring due to cracks in, in, in wear and tear on the exterior stone. Um, we're also starting selective restoration of exterior stone. We're doing window replacement uh, as well as French door restoration. Minnesota's got an extreme climate. It's really that change in climate, it's that cyclical change from hot to cold, from wet to dry, that, um, that really facilitates the decay process. The number one cause for most of the de deterioration that we're seeing is heat. It's a process called thermal hysteresis, and it's a, it's a progressive, irreversible change in the actual physical structure of the stone. These climatic effects slowly break down the stone's exterior. Heat expands the stone in the same way it affects wood. But unlike wood, the stone does not contract or return to its previous form. This process breaks down the original composition of the stone. It's almost like uh, a sugar cube, and this, the, the word sugaring is actually very, very accurate in terms of what it looks like when you're up close. If you can imagine a sugar cube straight out of the box is very smooth. You can tell it has a granular structure, but it still has a very smooth surface. When you get it wet, it starts to dissolve a little bit, and you, you start to see these uneven margins and, and a little bit more... Uh, uh, surface texture and that's exactly what's happening here. Once a crack starts it it is an opening that allows more and you know larger volumes of water to get in deeper into the building um, and the deeper water gets into the building envelope you know the bigger the problems you have. The exterior restoration involves multiple phases beginning with a pre-wash. Next, a cleaner is applied and allowed to soak into the stone for approximately 30 minutes, loosening and softening the grime and grit. Finally, the area is steamed and much of the grime falls away, bringing a renewed look and sometimes exposing other potentially harmful cracks. During this process, environmentally friendly cleaning products are used. Water and cleaner runoff are captured and deposited into large white holding tanks at the Capitol's base. The scaffolding surround is enclosed by a large white screen, a curtain that prevents construction dust from entering the outside environment, while at the same time protecting workers from nature's elements. In some cases, cleaning is not the answer. Workers grind down the high points of an area, producing a smooth, renewed surface where biological growth and water damage can no longer gain a foothold. There are cer certain areas where the the decay process has just gotten to a point where the stone is no longer functional or it's become dangerous. Those areas not conducive for repair will be carefully removed by workers and will be replaced with new block cut from similar mines. The importance of the French doors is not only for decoration but also for bringing in natural light. What Cass Gilbert had conceived was as you walk into the building you would see these extraordinary French doors on the sides or the, the front of the building and um, that just added to that element and, you know, part of that elegance that would be part of uh, anyone's experience in the Capitol. They're the original doors. So they have been on the building for over 100 years. Um, most of the problems that we see with those um, have to do with just uh, exposed wood where, the paint, where paint failures have occurred and water has gotten in. Uh, you know, there's just a little bit of deterioration and rot that comes with water uh, getting into places water shouldn't be. The doors are carefully removed and sent to a factory. Humidity controlled and spacious, the factory's environment is ideal for stripping, repairing damage, and cleaning and polishing the brass of the doors. The frames housing the doors are also in need of repair. A stripper is applied and covered with plastic to prevent the wood from drying out. This forces the stripper to soak in through the paint to soften it up. A second coat reactivates the first, further softening the paint. Twenty minutes later, the paint is scraped off. Repairs are made where necessary, 
and a new coat of paint is applied. After, the doors are returned from the factory. Workers reinstall them in their frames, and the newly restored doors look as they did over 100 years before. The windows on the exterior of the building really do play an important function. They not only bring in more light, but if you look at each level, there are a little bit different designs. Gilbert's idea of a working building, a space in need of illumination, continues with the placement of the windows, which also contribute to the theme of beauty and elegance. The windows that we're replacing now uh, were installed in the early 70s, I think 1973, 1974, and they haven't been touched since. Uh, these are aluminum windows that were installed and they've just reached the end of their lifespan. They're no longer performing uh, the way they should and that sets up other material for advanced or accelerated decay. To preserve this building is imperative because this is the place where for over 100 years people have come to make laws and so it's vital that the exterior stone is preserved because we want to make sure that all the intricate carving, all the details that were part of that original construction are still visible to the public. Inside and out, Minnesota's Capitol building will be restored. From beginning to end, results of the multi-year restoration project will breathe new life into the century-old structure. The Capitol restoration project is well underway. Here to provide an update on that project and where they're going to go from here, we have the Commissioner of the Department of Administration, Spencer Cronk. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. So, Commissioner, let's get right to it and just kind of, if you can, encapsulate the latest. Where are we in the grand scheme of this extensive project? Great. Well, as you know, we are making a historic investment in restoring our state capital, and we are in the middle of starting that process. We have now moved most tenants out of the capital basement um, and started the demolishing of that area so we can begin the abatement work and the restoration of the basement itself. Um, we're also doing a lot of prep work around the area to make sure that we're set up for the next stage of the capital restoration. So we prepared some temporary parking lots in front of the Capitol lawn, um, and we're also continuing with the exterior stone work around the Capitol exter uh, the exterior of the building as well. How do you think this restoration is going to impact the daily operations of the next legislative session? The next legislative session shouldn't be impacted that much. It's the 2015 session that will be impacted the most. But with any restoration project, there's going to be a lot of inconveniences, dust and noise and uh, diversions around your regular workflow from where you walk to your office to the chambers. Uh, so things like that will have to get uh, communicated to the public and to specific staff and Senate members and, and legislative members. Um, but we're well aware of that and equipped to make sure that that's as smooth as possible for this next legislative session. And so what do you expect those impacts to be both in 2014 and 2015? Well, the goal is to make sure that the chambers are open for all sessions going forward throughout the restoration effort. Uh, 2014, we should have most senators still in the Capitol building, um, but in 2015, a lot of those offices will be housed temporarily in a different space. Uh, that will make it more difficult for those senators, the staff, and the public to access their, their, their legislator. Uh, but we want to make sure that they have that access, they have the information to get to the right person at the right point in time, um, but it will be much more difficult uh, to do that. So we ask for patience <laughs> and we'll make sure that we're communicating the, the, the best way to, to make sure that you can interact with your legislator at that point. Let's talk a little bit more about the money. Um, there is a request to bond for an additional $126 million for this project in 2014. What will that money be used for? That will be used to complete the project. So this is a $272 million project. Um, we received the first two chunks of that money in the 2012 and 2013 legislative session. It was always planned for a three, uh, three request uh, period in three different sessions. And this will complete the project and so really uh, do the finishing work on the, the third phase of the, the capital restoration on the third floor um, and then also completing the exterior stone renovation. And let's speak a little more broadly about the bonding session. Your office is obviously intimately involved in these um, discussions. So there are $2.8 billion in requests at this point. What are you advocating for? What do you think the critical projects are and what, what needs to be included? Well, we certainly want to make sure that this capital restoration is done 
uh, successfully. And we have a bipartisan uh, committee that was the Capital Preservation Commission that was established. Uh, they unanimously voted for the proposal that uh, illustrates that $272 million project. And so we want to make sure that this year's request for $126 million is fulfilled to complete the project uh, successfully. My last question for you then, Commissioner, is just encapsulate, if you can, from the Department of Administration standpoint, what it's been like to oversee this capital restoration project and all of the different tentacles that are out there because of it. It's a lot of patience, and there's also a lot of apologies. I mean, certainly, if you think about a home remodel project, this is times a thousand. And so when you're doing a, a restoration of a kitchen or a bathroom in your home, um, there are inconveniences. There's going to be messes and dirt and dust and noise. Um, but we have a lot of different tenants here in the Capitol building. And we want to make sure that primarily we're supporting what the public's needs are for this building for the next hundred years. This is our seat of state government in Minnesota. It's a beautiful treasure that we have, and we want to make sure that it's preserved. Commissioner Spencer Cronk, thanks so much for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your time. My pleasure. Since the 1960s, October 15th has been designated White Cane Day, which helps raise awareness of the challenges and progress made for those with visual impairments. We want to raise awareness um, to show people, um, you know, the general public, that um, being blind or visually impaired is, is just, it just happens to be part of who people are. They can still function. Um, they are still independent members of society. Here to discuss some of the challenges involved with being legally blind and working here at the Minnesota Senate, we have Senator Tori Westrom joining us. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. You're welcome. Great to be here. Senator, let's begin with some of the key issues today facing those who are visually impaired. What are they? Well, just the practical issues, first of all. Uh, you know, you've got to learn to live independently uh, without sight. Um, there's a lot of adaptive techniques uh, that you pick up yourself. You can learn through uh, training uh, facilities that are uh, available through state services for the blind and uh, other uh, entities around the state, but uh, generally coordinated through state services for the blind in our state. And, and that's valuable to persons that are facing blindness or uh, uh, have been in an accident and uh, all of a sudden find themselves without eyesight, uh, it's, it runs the gamut. Some people are blind from birth, some people lose it uh, in their teens or 20s and others uh, as they get older. And so uh, uh, those are all challenges just living. The other thing is employment. For those in the working age, uh, unemployment is very high for persons with blindness and uh, that is an issue that they still face and, and it's a, an issue that I've always held near and dear to my heart because I think uh, that that number should uh, come down and, and could come down uh, the more we offer uh, persons with disabilities and, and blindness specifically uh, training opportunities and, and employment opportunities. You talked a little bit about challenges. It's safe to assume that it had to have been fairly challenging to try to navigate around a building that's more than a hundred years old. What were some of the things that you faced when you became a member of the legislature? It, it was a big building <laughs> and so it, you know it just seems massive when you start looking at this and then the ca capitol complex with the state office building across the street uh, but when i first was elected i came down for about three days literally and just walked and traced the capitol complex the state office building and the capitol uh, at the time and you kind of take it on in pieces. Where, where do you need to go for committee? Where do you need to go for offices? Where do you need to go to the bathroom? Where do you need to go to the practical things? And, and, and then branch out from there. And, and that's what I did. And over now 17 years, it's become more second nature. Uh, but admittedly, this past year with uh, the, me uh, first joining the Senate uh, for the first time uh, after the 2012 election, I, there's, there's a lot of building uh, space that I have not covered in the Capitol because in the House of Representatives we use the north end of the Capitol and most of our meetings are over in the state office building uh, and conference committees are in the uh, committee rooms in the Capitol but there's a lot of areas that I hadn't uh, been to just because it wasn't part of the House of Representatives. So in the Senate I did some of the same thing. I, I took uh, an afternoon or a day with uh, the sergeant's office actually at that uh, this year and, and just became more familiar with the rooms around the Capitol 
you memorize it, and, and that's what I've done. And, and again, you get that, you work from a base map in your mind of you know, where the elevator is, where, where uh, the chambers are, and then you, at least I, branch out from there in my mind and figure out where things are connected. Uh, when you come down the steps, if you go right, what will you hit? If you go left, what will you hit? Where the rooms are? But uh, let me share a, a, an experience I had this year. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, one of the things is you got to use your memory. Where are you? And uh, there was one time I was going to committee, and uh, I had been at an event on ground floor, and somehow had had in my mind I was on first floor, and kept going down to the to the north end looking for the committee room, and lo and behold, I could not find that committee room. Well, long story short, I I uh, turned myself around a couple different times, went back and forth, and finally I ran into somebody I, I knew, and I said, can you just tell me, is this first floor or ground floor? And she told me it's ground floor, and that, that of course, solved my problem. But, uh, you know, you don't have those visual cues, and, and something didn't look right because the doors weren't where they were supposed to be. So I knew I, I was on uh, the wrong floor, but of course, you, you kind of get turned around uh, when you can't see, and, and so you're, uh, you know, you have to deal with that. So, Senator, I want to ask, what are some of the tools that you utilize to help effectively legislate, like technology, you know, some of the things besides your memory that, that help you here at the, the Capitol? Sure. I use a computer with speech to do a lot of things. So the laptops we carry around here in the Senate, we used to carry them in the House, and they still do. Uh, that is a, a main piece that I use, uh, speech on my computer. Um, you know, I talked about state services for the blind. Uh, they have computer tech folks, and you know, they they help me get my computer set up just like they would help other people that are uh, getting in, you know, into a new job or uh, an independent living situation. And, and so uh, that, the computer with speech is a big thing. You know, with somebody that lost my eyesight at age 14, I had learned to read, I had done all the things that a sighted person does, and so I hadn't learned Braille when I was, was a, a, a child. And so I don't read Braille as proficiently as some that maybe have been blind since birth, or some that didn't have the technology that we have nowadays to use to, to read uh, documents, emails, Word documents, uh, legislation, uh, websites, uh, all of that stuff is read on my computer. And so, incidentally, I don't use Braille as much as some people that maybe have learned it since birth or weren't uh, weren't around when they had the technology or the technology wasn't as available. But I think uh, the younger uh, a person is right now, the more they probably use technology to, to navigate the, the, the needs of the world. Well, I really appreciate you coming in and providing very interesting perspective on what it's like to legislate with certain challenges, so thank you. Well, thank you. That concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.